Thanks very much, Tom, and uh, good morning to you all. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, and I want to congratulate Tom and the others associated with this conference on a most interesting conference. And uh, with you, I, I join with you all in mourning uh, the loss of Geoffrey Gray, who made a significant contribution to, to this history as to so many other areas. As the Vietnam War was turning into a bitter experience for the United States and about to bring down President Johnson's uh, administration, Johnson once was heard to cry out, I can't get out, I can't finish it with what I've got, what the hell am I supposed to do? Now without making pretentious comparisons with the occupant of the Oval Office, that is a cry that has resonated with historians of the war. <laughs> The long and often controversial development of this official history can, I think, be seen in four phases. The first was slow and often frustrating. And a lot of that is due to the way in which the project was initiated, about which I uh, don't know very much about what happened uh, beforehand. Uh, Michael McKernan was telling me things that I didn't know uh, as recently as yesterday. But the outcome of various discussions was that the cabinet authorized an, a new official history handed that task uh, to the Australian War Memorial, but in what I might uh, euphemistically describe as an open-ended way. The advertisement that I answered sought an official historian of Australia's involvement in the Malayan emergency and the Vietnam War. It indicated a minimum number of years to spend on the project, but not a maximum. A minimum number of volumes, but not a maximum. The official historian uh, would appoint a team of authors and researchers, but there was no budgetary allocation, so there was no indication of the number of authors or researchers. There'd been no scoping study on matters like the availability of sources or the desired framework of volumes. Reference was made to an editorial advisory committee, uh, but no such committee was appointed for several years. And when I turned up on my first day, there wasn't an office or a desk where I could sit. <laughs> I did face some challenges, so it's not surprising uh, that it took a little time to get the show on the road. Well, we found accommodation in the, first of all, in the business district of, uh, uh, of Canberra, then an office over at the ANU, uh, before eventually being uh, accommodated very handsomely in the War Memorial's then new administration building. I had to go around and visit departments and agencies to find out what records were available, and I discovered that some agencies were better than others in knowing what records they had and how they were organized and even where they were. <clears throat> some, shall we say, were quicker than others to recognize that when the cabinet said the official historian had unrestricted access to all relevant government documents, they meant exactly that. But most importantly, the Cabinet had authorised the history with bipartisan approval, but had not made any specific allocation of funds to the memorial. That was, uh, the, so I had to seek funding and support through two different channels. And the first, uh, apparently intended to be the main one, was through the annual appropriation process for the memorial. Now, for a project that was clearly destined, uh, designed to take several years, that was hugely problematic, as much for the memorial as for myself. But with working through the memorial, I gradually gained some funding for, uh, initially for researchers, and some of them over time were able to turn into authors. But at the same time, I was looking for suitable authors who'd be willing to write significant portions of the, uh, the history without requiring memorial funding. And in this, I was extraordinarily fortunate. Uh, from this organization, Peter Dennis and, alas, Jeffrey Gray, Chris Clark uh, from the Air Power Study Center, and Barry Smith from the ANU. Now, I believe that not only the memorial and, and myself, but the, the government, indeed, of the nation should be immensely grateful that such distinguished historians were willing to make major contributions to the project without remuneration above that from their existing employer. But my point is that handling these challenges not only took a good deal of time and effort, but it meant that the shape of the project, the number of volumes, the topics, uh, uh, the scope of each one, was 
influenced, um, I think, unduly by the, the resources that I could obtain, either from within the memorial or from external sources. And that did have some unfortunate long-term effects, some of which are still playing out. But as if those battles were not enough, I opened another front. <coughs> It became clear to me very quickly that in order to tell the story uh, from Malaya to Vietnam, at any level, the military level, operational level, political, domestic politics, international politics, strategy, the project had to include the Indonesian confrontation as well as the Malayan emergency in the Vietnam War. But this is back in the 1980s. Anything to do with Indonesia is highly sensitive was highly sensitive. Memories not only of confrontation, but also Balibo were still fresh in many minds. And this is the era when official defense statements were uh, saying that any threat to Australia would come, quote, from or through Indonesia. So we were faced with the paradoxical outcome that there was no problem in producing an official history with unrestricted access and no censorship uh, to what is often seen as a political and strategic disaster, but it was proving almost impossible to record an outstandingly successful example of Australian statecraft. Now, for some time with what, and at this point you can insert principal determination or pig-headed obstinacy according to your choice, I kept pressing the case. After several years and some, I think, significant changes of personnel in high places, uh, the change was made. Confrontation was included, and they, only then did the project become the official history of Australia's involvement in Southeast Asian conflicts, 1948 to 75. And I think this inclusion was absolutely crucial, because one simply can't understand the story of Vietnam, let alone anything else, uh, without so much of the Vietnam story is linked with the confrontation story. Uh, to take just one example, when the government introduced the National Service Scheme that sent thousands of conscripts to fight and 200 of them to die in Vietnam, um, Michael mentioned it yesterday, you know, we all talk about it. I've done it myself. Did you serve? No, my number didn't come out of the barrel. But in fact, uh, at the time that uh, system was introduced, it was generally seen as, and I quote the Sydney Morning Herald headline of the next morning, preparing against war with Indonesia. And again, the arguments at military level, operational level over tactics in Vietnam cannot be understood without understanding how the Australians fought in confrontation. So for what it's worth, I think the inclusion of confrontation into the project was the most important contribution I made to the official history tradition the continuities and discontinuities between the three Southeast Asian conflicts have a continuing relevance to current political, military, and uh, strategic debates. Indeed, I've condensed some of the lessons of that into various papers and lectures that I give uh, today to military and civil service uh, people. But all this time, uh, the, official, the idea of an official history of the Vietnam War, if you mention official history and Vietnam War in the same sentence, it aroused, shall we say, considerable interest. Uh, and at the same time, it was clearly going to take time before the first volumes would appear. So during this time, I accepted invitations to speak to many audiences, official, military, academic, general public. And along with my growing team, I spoke both, both about the official history in general, as well as, about, uh, as well as giving conference papers and publishing articles from our research just to show that we were on the job. And it's during this time that I read a lot of the, the papers that have already been mentioned, uh, particularly by um, Peter Stanley this morning, by both Bean and Long. And I was at pains to emphasize that I was working in the tradition of Bean and Long. Uh, the unrestricted access to records, the absence of political and official censorship. But no less important than that, I emphasize that I also was working in the O'Neill tradition, uh, as he had adopted. Uh, and there are several points uh, that emerge on that, uh, but perhaps the most salient one uh, was the uh, <clears throat> inclusion of a good deal of material on the, at the strategic and diplomatic level 
uh, as you've just heard, uh, that, that he pioneered. I was very impressed by that. Indeed, um, I think uh, Peter mentioned this morning that there was a, a FESRA for Robert O'Neill, which was launched just last week. Uh, and David Horner has written in a, uh, uh, a, written a chapter on the evolution of the official history tradition in that. And I did a chapter on uh, O'Neill as uh, official historian of Korea, uh, laying emphasis on that, the inclusion of the volume on strategy and diplomacy, as well as a couple of other things which I'll mention. But to counter the fears uh, that were going around, there were all sorts of rumors about this official historian of the Vietnam War. Uh, some were thinking I'd be a, 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 an apologist for the conservative establishment. Um, Others uh, were alleging that I was a long-haired academic, well, maybe not long-haired, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, who was about to appoint Dr. Cairns to write a volume on the home front. <clears throat> so I, I, I was at pains to emphasize my distance from the social and political conflicts in, in Australia. And here is a re one respect where I'm uh, very unlike Bean. In the peak years of the war and the protest uh, movement, while some of my contemporaries were fighting in Vietnam and others were protesting on the streets, I was on the other side of the world, writing a doctoral thesis uh, on European international history between the wars, between the world wars. Uh, so any protests I saw on the, on the nightly news were being held in London or Paris or Berkeley. Uh, any coverage of the, the war itself was, of course, the American War. I knew, in fact, very little about what Australia was doing uh, uh, militarily or politically. I then worked for a time uh, as a researcher on a British uh, official history before coming back to Australia, helping to set up the uh, historical section in foreign affairs, which produces, uh, which ever since then has produced volumes of documents on Australian foreign policy, and then moved to the ANU to write a book on uh, the early history of Australian foreign policy and policy making. So I had experience of doing scholarly work, both in an academic and in an official environment. And I'd worked on a number of, had background in a number of areas related to this sort of field, but I'd never worked directly on Vietnam, nor had I ever been identified um, uh, even by implication, with any particular view on the war. Um, I could be genuinely independent. Now, mention was made earlier this morning about the question of the audience for official historians. Um, and I was very conscious that the audience for these, uh, the, well, for post-1945 conflicts uh, were significantly changed. We did have to, to maintain that commitment to writing, uh, writing for the wider, ride, <coughs> widest possible readership. Bean, of course, famously vowed never to write a sentence that could not be understood by a housemaid of average intelligence. Once in a rhetorical flourish, I quoted that sentence when I was talking to a staff student seminar at an Australian university, and I asked, I wonder what is the modern day equivalent of a housemaid of average intelligence? From the back of the room, a voice, a weary voice asserted, a fourth year honours student. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a, an understandable, understandably cynical jest, but it does actually lead to an important point. As I wrote in this uh, piece about Bob O'Neill, he was researching and writing it, between the well, basically during the 70s, late 60s through to early 80s, which was a time of major transformation in both academic and public interest and involvement in Australian history. So whereas Bean and Long had come from that tradition of higher journalism and most of their colleagues, my colleagues and I would be like O'Neill, basically academically trained, and writing for a readership of whom many were academically trained. Indeed, I often reflected as I finished each chapter of Crises and Commitments and then A Nation at War, uh, that the subject matter would have justified a book. Indeed, soon enough, there were PhD theses and books addressing many of the topics that my fellow authors and I had to summarize in a chapter or a paragraph or two. Uh, and often those theses or books were 
setting out to show just where the official historian had got it wrong. Now, I don't complain about that. That goes with the territory. It's part of the role of the official historian. You'll get used to it, Craig. <clears throat> official historians aim not to have the last word, but to present a well-informed and balanced account which should, as a uh, which should serve as a platform for further research and writing. But ever since, those, uh, since the 70s, I think the whole community is much more attuned uh, to a fairly robust discussion of sources and evidence. I just hope that uh, later people, uh, when uh, working on our stuff, will rec uh, recognise how much attention we and my colleagues like Craig Wilcox and Libby Stewart, Chris Waters, Ashley Eakin, Sue Langford, how much attention we gave to getting the footnotes and the bibliographies right to make their job easier uh, to make for those who follow. Now, by the end of several years, I finally had an excellent office in the new admin building at the War Memorial. I had a team of authors and researchers working on several volumes. I had an advisory committee with, uh, which included some leading academics and two members of the Memorial Council, and that was extremely valuable. Uh, and we were producing conference papers and articles to show that we were being productive. Um, so that should have been a, a very good productive phase, but then the second phase uh, arose. A whole series of conflicts which threatened to define the project in the public mind. Uh, I'll go over them uh, quickly, but um, <clears throat> one that some of you may remember, uh, somebody who, to get around the problem with authors, I was, had a scheme where I was trying to turn some researchers into co-authors. Uh, but one of the putative co-authors uh, wanted to have more credit but to distance himself from the content of the volume. And credit and responsibility are usually seen as two sides of the same coin. Um, so I came up with a formula which says authorship is designated as Edwards with instead of Edwards and. Uh, that seemed to be reasonably satisfactory. Uh, but the gentleman concerned did not agree. It went to four separate independent inquiries, uh, some of which were covered on front pages of the paper. It culminated in the Ombudsman inquiry. They all said that the approach taken by the memorial and myself had been appropriate, indeed generous. Uh, but it took a lot of time and uh, uh, so on. And there were other controversies going on at the same time. Uh, in fact, I had to take on a major media company at one stage. Um, I'll speak about that later, but I don't want to be distracted on that. But then came the third phase, and that's what made it all worthwhile. If one was setting it to music, it's uh, almost like a triumphal march. In the period, in seven calendar years, we produced one volume each year. So from mid-year to mid-year, it was about seven volumes in six years. Two were on politics, strategy, and diplomacy by myself. One, the first of three to be on army operations in Vietnam by Ian McNeil and Ashley Eakins. One on operations in the Malayan Emergency and Confrontation by Peter Dennis and Jeffrey Gray, and we'll comment more on those. One on medical matters, Brendan O'Keefe with a section by Barry Smith. One on Air Force operations in Vietnam by Chris Clark. And one on naval operations throughout the whole Southeast Asian period by, again, by Geoffrey Gray. My aim was to, as general editor, was to give each author freedom of judgment. I'm not going to tell uh, these people what they should uh, conclude or not, but with sufficient coordination to avoid undue overlap or blatant contradiction, uh, even but allowing for differences in emphasis. I mean coverage of the relations between the Air Force and the Army in the early years in Vietnam was going to be slightly, uh, have a slightly different emphasis in Chris's uh, volume from um, Ian McNeil's uh, volume. But you can get the, uh, get the picture. I wanted to show ha uh, having strategic diplomatic coverage as well as operational coverage, I wanted to show how the high level strategic decisions often taken in Canberra translated into the experience of those on the ground. It was not a, just a matter of uh, covering it from private to general, it was from private to prime minister. 
Now, the army in Vietnam volumes uh, were seeking to convey the experience from the, the level of private up to uh, task force commanders or chief of staff even. But to give it coherence, you have to have a, so, a, some sort of primary focus to, to keep the, uh, uh, the narrative going. And we focused there at the level of task force commander with a good deal of attention to uh, battalion commanders as well. But that does not detract from the, you know, the frontline experience of the private soldier. And uh, in the tradition of uh, O'Neill's second volume, the operational volumes would discuss not just what they did, uh, but the t uh, at a greater level, I think, than previous uh, official histories, the tactical and doctrinal issues, which have, particularly those which have a lasting relevance. Relations with the Americans, uh, including arguments over tactics. Relations with other allies, South Vietnamese and New Zealanders. What we assessed of the uh, enemy's um, skills and capabilities. Inter-service relations. Judgments uh, were to be fair-minded, but not held back. Courage and skill would be appropriately recognized, but so would failures or misjudgments. There was to be no whitewashing or cover-up of incidents of friendly fire or the catastrophic Datto minefield. Those volumes were all well received and well reviewed and, and two of those books won major prizes. Uh, we felt that if the volume on politics during the war was being praised by people ranging from Anne Curtoys to Gerard Henderson, we had to be doing something right. <coughs> after all the conflicts and uh, controversies, oh, during all these conflicts, after the conflicts and controversies, the unit, both those working in the memorial and the, our external colleagues like Jeff and Peter and Chris, uh, enjoyed, I think, a, a very satisfactory, uh, a, a good feeling and a sense of camaraderie and I, much of the credit for that must yet go to the personality of Ian McNeil. Uh, then we went into the, a, a fourth phase which was slower again, um, largely due I think to uh, planning problems for, right from the beginning. My time was up in early 1996. For a time I served, continued to serve as a consulting historian to the memorial and then I moved on from that and the then director of the memorial, took over some of the roles of the official historian. Ian McNeil's death in 1998 was a huge blow to everyone involved, both professionally and personally. There were many reasons why Ashley Eakins, who took over from Ian, uh, took until 2003 and then 2012 to complete the last two volumes. But I think some of that delay, at least, can be traced to the planning and resourcing issues that I referred to at the beginning of this paper. It was only after the last volume in the series had appeared that I could, in a very deliberate uh, reflection of uh, the practice of Bean and Long, write a single, relatively short book, a book um, by the official historian but not part of the official history, which distilled some of the uh, major themes and it also updated and introduced the volumes of the official history to a, a, a wider audience. And I must say I was somewhat chuffed when in one reviewer of that book described the entire series as a, a minor national treasure. Uh, that book is in fact called Australia and the Vietnam War, but Vietnam doesn't come into it until about chapter nine, I think. Um, it, it's, it is a coverage of the whole period, and that's the only way I think it makes sense. So, to use the world of defense and the military as somewhat acronym for maniac, so uh, one of my favorite acronyms uh, from the military is ORLL, Operations Report and Lessons Learned. What are some of the lessons learned for this? The absence of any continuing organizational base for official histories means that there's no organizational memory of their structures and their requirements. Each one has had to be started from scratch all over again, uh, which is, a, apart from anything else, is not the most cost-effective way of, um, uh, of producing them. Clearly, the, the planning and preparation for later official histories and comparable projects uh, coming under the aegis of the Australian War Memorial has improved out of all sight with the employment of scoping studies and more precise contractual arrangements. 
In fact, as an aside, may I say that the procedure for the recent appointment of the Timor Iraq Afghanistan campaigns, where I was, uh, in which I was briefly involved, uh, seems to have gone to the opposite extreme. Uh, some in high places are trying to prescribe the subject matter and the timing of each volume to the uh, and the budget to the last dollar and the, the week of publication. I think we might have something to learn about getting the right balance between prescribing performance and flexibility. Uh, I'd also recommend the device of some form of advisory or steering committee, not in any sense to direct judgments, but to assist the historian uh, and his team through the inevitable obstacles. The whole process, uh, during this whole process, I certainly learned a lot about my own strengths and weaknesses. And there are many things that, looking back, I could have and should have and wished I had done otherwise. But overall, I remain proud of what we all achieved and very grateful for the honour of appointment as an official war historian. I'm hugely grateful for the team that it was my privilege to lead, and it's largely due to their skills and dedication that collectively we produced a result that I believe is worthy of the tradition founded by Charles Bean. Thank you. Questions and comments, please. Anne-Marie, then Craig. Maybe this is quick to answer, but I didn't understand from Bob O'Neill's presentation that his history was approved by Cabinet, but after that it has been. Is that right? And what's, the, what's uh, caused that change and what difference has that made? Does that make sense? I, uh, I understood that his was uh, approved by Cabinet um, uh, and also the, um, uh, and certainly in my case, it, it, it went to Cabinet uh, as what's known as an under the line uh, appointment, so it's just noted uh, unless somebody wants to, to question it. Uh, but it also went to the uh, leader of the opposition because it would involve access to governments of both uh, political persuasions. Um, I was certainly of, uh, under the uh, impression that that had been followed by, uh, in O'Neill's case as well. I don't think I ever saw the, the cabinet minute to that effect, so I can't confirm that. Michael, do you know that? There's two separate issues, isn't there? The, there's the cabinet decision yeah. to, 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 to mm. have the thing written, mm. and then there's the cabinet decision to... Um, to appoint you in your case, uh, mm, mm. and there are two two separate yeah, things. And the yeah. big mistake, and I agree with you entirely, the big mistake when the memorial put when the memorials council put it up to government to fund mm. the writing of the Vietnam history as we thought of it then mm. was that it was uh, the, the, the memorial. I don't know how they did it. I wasn't there at the time, but they didn't associate any funding with. Mm. Mm. That, that's just madness. Mm. And, and, and I agree with you. All your problems, such as they were, stemmed from that total failure of the memorial. And as I said to you yesterday, I think it goes back to how Bob O'Neill was funded, mm. that is, externally to the memorial. Mm. And I thought, think they just thought that that could continue. Mm. Um, well, what, what, yeah, what we learned this morning, uh, I hadn't uh, realised this, that uh, Bob actually did get some funding from the... Um, or th from or through the memorial uh, for I think it was six years or so and then uh, as it went on and on he said look I'll finish it but yeah, I, I won't yeah. require payment. And that is certainly true and so, the memorial also provided mm, mm. the staffing so Daryl McIntyre's position was a memorial mm. position yeah. and then Jeff Williams took that mm. over mm. but um, there hadn't been a recognition I think that the project that you were responsible for was much bigger in scale and that you know one research assistant provided by the memorial just wasn't going to do it. Mm, mm. But they, uh, well there seemed to be some understanding of that because there, there, there was reference uh, uh, in the advertisement to you know a team of authors and researchers and it's going to be a number of volumes and um, what I heard when I turned up was uh, well um, 
uh, Bean thought he was going to get his all done in about five years, and it took 22 uh, years. So uh, we thought the best thing to do was to just appoint uh, the historian, and then you know, then let you sort it all out. But yeah, but you've got mm, to also mm. understand that it was the out, it was the outgoing director Noel Flanagan who got the project started, and the incoming mm. director Jim Fleming mm. um, had, I would think, and I, I don't know whether you would agree with me, minimal interest in it. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember mm. Jim Fleming saying to me, I can't stand this Edwards fellow. He only ever comes to me when he wants something. Well, what else were you supposed to do? <laughs> I, I'll provide the pastoral support. <laughs> Before we go to Craig, can you just describe to us, though, the interview that you had prior to your appointment? Can you recall it, what you were asked and what you said? Sorry. Did the... you have an interview before you were appointed the official uh, historian? Oh, yes. Uh, Can you yeah. tell us a bit about that? Um, not much, uh, the, <laughs> except uh, Bob O'Neill was um, on the, the panel. Um, I think Geoffrey Blaney was, and also Tom Daly. And um, Daly afterwards came out and said, um, uh, yeah, very, very useful thing, you know, uh, official histories are used in uh, staff colleges uh, everywhere. And I thought, well, I'm not actually writing for a, a staff college manual, but um, you know, thank you, General. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll all be happy. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I think the points that I emphasised um, were more or less what I was saying today about my my independence, as it were, that I'd had background in doing scholarly work within an official environment. And so I, I knew what it was to, you know, to satisfy two sets of audiences, as it were, uh, to jump through two sets of hoops. Um, uh, and that my background was, uh, you know, I hadn't been there in any sense. I hadn't been like Bean uh, or Long, you know, observing. Uh, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't been involved in war and O'Neill hadn't been at Korea, but he had served in Vietnam. But was it put but, to you that being uh, quite distinct from Vietnam was a strength in your favour? Was that ever put to you? I don't recall that it was put to me, but it seemed to be accepted when I put it to them. Uh, I think that's, that, you know, I don't know what was going in, uh, on in those people's minds. Uh, Thank you. Mm. Uh, Craig and then Michael Piggott. Peter, thanks very much for that really honest and reflective paper. I had only a passing engagement with your project, but what really struck me at the time working there was how important it was for you and, and possibly for the other authors who, who I didn't work with, just getting the chronology right, just laying things out as it actually happened in order, at least in your own mind, and then transferring that to the page, just to challenge how most people had developed a picture of Vietnam or of other conflicts or of our social strife during it and got it completely wrong because a, a simple exercise like that hadn't happened. And I wondered how important those sorts of things, those sorts of decisions were to you when you were thinking about the history in the abstract when you started. What did you want to do with it? Did, 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 or did you simply think that starting with putting things in order was a good idea? Did you, did, did you have other visions of how the history might look? Um, I was fairly clear that it had to be, um, you know, it was going to be basically a chronological narrative. Um, there might be spin-off articles which uh, would, you know, analyse particular topics. Um, but yes, get, getting it right, just getting things in the right order. And I mean, what was the most revealing thing that came out of that was just how the decision to become, an, or the main decision, it was a whole series of decisions as we know, uh, but the main decision in, uh, to be committed in April 1965, um, just how that was taken and what was in the minds of senior policy makers. I mean, discovering that the, uh, just bef the, the last major defense committee report, that's the most senior advisor uh, body, um, before the uh, introduction of conscription and a whole lot of other defence decisions uh, in November, uh, seven, um, November 65, uh, they said, well, we, we need to upgrade our capacity. Um, so uh, 
because we face three conflicts, the, the face of possibility of three simultaneous conflicts. One was an escalation of confrontation against Malaysia. Number two, a recurring theme, which everyone forgets, the possibility of a war with Indonesia across Australia's only land border between East and West New Guinea. And only number three, we might have to do something in Indochina, what was referred to as the CETO area. So the, you know, the, the, the lottery system that uh, you know, we all associate with Vietnam, um, that was the order of priorities, uh, certainly in, in, um, in many people's minds. Whether Menzies had the same idea, of course, is a, is a different matter. But it's, it's, it's only when you sort of work out what committee happened when, what cabinet decision was taken when, that you can actually see it actually worked out quite differently from, uh, you know, as you say, from, from the way people remember it. November 64? Yes, November 64, yeah, that, that decision. But uh, yeah, d just getting a sense uh, and, and just getting right the, uh, the, the relations with the US and how they changed. I mean, uh, everyone says now, oh yes, the, the Guam Doctrine in 1969 uh, had a huge effect because um, uh, that was when President Nixon said to uh, you know all his allies, and particularly in this part of the world, that they got to stand on their own feet and you know do much more to themselves. That same message had been coming from uh, Dean Rusk and others in the Kennedy administration from the early 60s. Um, so you know while the um, people here have been saying you know we're we're all the way with LBJ. We weren't all the way with LBJ, and he went, uh, even Harold Holt wasn't all the way with LBJ uh, uh, soon after that. But at the, the, uh, running through that whole period was the Americans uh, saying publicly, you know, we want you as allies, and you're great, and we love having you next to each other, and privately saying, you better pull your weight, you know. Uh, are you just uh, one of these other allies who are willing to fight to the last American? Yeah, I remember in the Johnson archives when I was doing the Holt book, someone had prepared a detailed study of Australian commitments to previous wars and had shown this to Johnson to send to Holt to show that for head of population, what we were doing in Vietnam was the least we'd ever contributed. Yeah, and in fact, it contributed to the change in American policy because in 67, uh, there was, a, and Johnson is still in, uh, and things are going really bad, he sends out two of his most senior advisors, Clark Clifford and Maxwell Taylor, to twist arms. And he, uh, they went to Australia, New Zealand, all the troop contributing countries, as they were called. Uh, and they said, look, you've got to contribute more troops uh, because each one that you send uh, is worth a hundred Americans in terms of what we can get through Congress. Uh, and, uh, and then Clark Clifford went uh, afterwards said that he had done that comparison and he'd found that the Australians had so sent however many hundreds of thousands of people abroad and we were jibbing now at raising the commitment to Vietnam uh, to 7,000. He said, well, you know, and he was actually turning the American policy uh, towards withdrawal, even before Johnson pulled out of the uh, uh, pulled out of the presidency. Mm. Thank you, Michael Pickett. Um, Peter, thanks for the paper. One continuity you might identify in each of the official histories is what, as you expressed it, you do your best with the sources and the resources, and mm. then you leave it. And if others want to write an entire PhD on what you focused on in a chapter. Fine, that's the nature of mm. history. Mm -hmm. And now we have the Peter Yule project. Mm. Would you like to comment? Does it does that seem out of sync? Well, um, I, I believe he's just written a piece for Wartime, which I haven't uh, haven't yet seen, haven't yet read. Um, but that is not. A, um, he, I think Peter Yule has made it clear that that's not rewriting uh, that section of the official history. But one of the things that I did not know 
at the time. You know, it's a classic example of it seemed a good idea at the time. Um, I thought I was being very, you know, very successful in getting probably the most distinguished historian of medical matters in Australia, F.B. Smith, to write a section on the Agent Orange controversy. What I didn't know, perhaps I could have, I don't know, is that this was at the very worst time to be commissioning, uh, to be tackling that uh, topic. There were major investigations, or a, a major inquiry going on right at that time uh, in the what's called the Institute of Medicine uh, in the United States, surveying the, the whole um, area. Um, there was also another study of uh, the, the history of repatriation uh, in Australia by um, uh, Jackie Reese and Clem Lloyd, I think. Clem Lloyd and Jackie Reese, that's right. Uh, that was going on at the same time. Uh, and in fact, it, it was... Uh, it was not the right time to be doing that. So it was, it was unfair to Barry, in a way, to, to, to ask him to do it, though we didn't know it at the time. Um, and I, th I still think that what Barry did uh, was a good piece of work. But um, it's going to look very different in the light of, uh, of what we now know. Uh, but as far as that, that Peter, the, the Peter Ewell exercise, um, the memorial actually you know, th there's been something of a campaign by not the Vietnam veterans, but a certain section of the Vietnam veteran community, and it's important to make that distinction, um, about that particular uh, section of it. Um, the memorial uh, consulted me uh, on that, and I recommended that uh, I said, as I had said previously in a paper, the paper on the, the War Wounds Conference, um, organized by the memorial uh, about three or four years ago, that a new study would be a good idea because so much had come out. It's now 20 plus years uh, uh, since that. Uh, there is a lot more evidence. Um, but I still think that a lot of the insights uh, from Barry Smith will uh, still be applicable in, in, even in the light of the new evidence. The last question, Jeff McGinley. Uh, very quick one. You, Americans were challenging Australia, New Zealand, etc., about the scale of our commitments. Was that were they thinking in, term, in relative terms of comparing World War II's overall size versus Vietnam's size, and I suppose scaling their, their own understanding their own commitment, and that they, the number of troops they were committing was pretty different to the number of troops they committed to World War II. Mm. And they, did they scale their numbers <coughs> accordingly? Uh, I don't think they. <laughs> They did. They initially recognised that Australia was, uh, you know, on a comparative basis, that the the Australian contribution was quite significant, and it was much larger than, for example, our commitments to the emergency or confrontation. Um, but they um, they were still under such pressure, and even when they were working towards with, uh, withdrawal, they were still putting pressure on. Uh, the, the third countries, as they were known, um, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand and the rest, to maintain their um, commitments at the same level. Uh, and that was producing enormous political problems uh, back here. But um, no, it, it, it's, uh, you know, that, I don't think it got as uh, statistical as that, but, uh, you know, they just said, we, um, we want you guys there and we want you to stay there. Thank you. Would you please thank Peter for his presentation?